Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining me tonight via Hopkins at Home. My name is Raymond Simons, and I'm a Giacconi Postdoctoral Fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute, or STSCI. So I want to thank the organizers of this series for doing all of the behind the scenes work to set this up. And I also want to thank the Office of Public Outreach at STSCI for creating near, nearly all of the visuals uh, I plan to show you today. So I'll save plenty of time for questions and answers at the end of my talk. But please note that you can submit your questions at any time via the chat box below this video on your screen. This talk is part of a series of events coordinated by the Johns Hopkins University and STSCI to generate awareness, interest, and excitement for NASA's great observatories and their science. Tonight, I want to discuss a remarkable new NASA observatory, the James Webb Space Telescope. You might also hear it referred to as Webb or JWST. So Webb is a supersized infrared telescope and is considered the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Much like what Hubble has done for us over the last few decades, over these next few years, Webb will truly revolutionize our understanding of the universe. This is an observatory that is over 30 years in the making and is set to launch to space on December 18th of this year. So in only 51 days. And to make this talk even more relevant to this Hopkins at Home series, the Science and Missions Operations Center for Webb are actually located on the north side of the Hopkins Homewood campus in Baltimore at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So this left image is a picture of the Missions Operations Center. So the Homewood campus is effectively Webb's home on Earth. And so first I wanna briefly explore the goals and strengths of the James Webb Space Telescope and answer the questions, why does it need to be in space? And why is it specializing in gathering infrared light? So let's set the stage. So what are the questions that motivate us to build large telescopes like Webb? What I'm showing you with this movie is a computer simulation of a small chunk of the universe evolved from immediately after the Big Bang to the present day. This simulation includes gravity, pressures, black holes, star formation, and the stretching and expanding of space. A running clock is shown in the bottom left of the screen. So what you see is the universe taking shape over billions of years. Each bright knot is a galaxy, for scale, our own Milky Way galaxy contains roughly 500 billion stars like our own sun, but galaxies come in many shapes and sizes. You see these galaxies forming and colliding under the influence of gravity. You'll start, see, you'll start seeing these galaxies light up as new stars form and explode. You also see what look like little bombs going off as the black holes in the centers of these galaxies are being fed and start spewing energy back out into the universe. And so the key question that we are in pursuit of is, how did the universe evolve from a messy soup of gas and dark matter into the galaxies, stars, and planets that we find around us today? So what was the universe like after the Big Bang? What are the characteristics of galaxies as the universe aged over billions of years? Then as gas cools in these galaxies, stars will eventually form. And so how do these stars form, live, and die? And finally, what kind of worlds are formed around these stars? And how, how special is our Earth and solar system in supporting life? And so these are the questions that the James Webb Space Telescope was built to answer. JWST is set to launch on December 18th of this year at 7.20 a.m. Eastern, so set your calendars. It's destined for a location known as L2, which is well beyond the orbit of the moon. It will begin science operations six months afterwards. So here's an illustration of the observatory and its final configuration. In short, this is the most ambitious space observatory NASA has ever launched. And what I want to do in this talk is introduce you to some of the exciting science that we could expect from the telescope and some of the engineering that makes it possible. So this is a mission led by NASA, 
and it stands on the shoulders of previous great NASA space telescopes. So why do we launch telescopes into space? Well, Earth's orbit blocks some wavelengths of light before they can reach Earth and blurs the light that does actually reach the ground. So to capture more of the light in the universe, we must send telescopes to space that have specialized instruments. So starting in, in the 90s, NASA launched a series of space-based observatories to study different wavelengths of light. The Spitzer Space Telescope, which is the, the one in the bottom left there, uh, operated from 2003 to 2020, and it studied infrared light. The Chandra Observatory, which is the, the middle one there, launched in 1999 and still operates today, and it studied X-ray light. And my personal favorite, the Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990 and is still operating today, and that studies ultraviolet, visible, and near-infrared light. And so what have these observat observatories shown us? So these, these telescopes observe different wavelengths of light, as I just said, offering, and they offer unique perspectives of objects in space. So for example, in the top left, when observers around the world first reported seeing the Crab Nebula, in 1054 AD, they described it as a new star. In reality, they observed the death of a star, a supernova explosion about 6,500 light years from Earth. Chandra observations and x-rays gave us a new view into the heart of the nebula that was left behind, revealing details about uh, the hot gas circling a, a pole star in the center. As another example, in the top right, I'm showing you the bright star Zeta O. The star is obscured by dust in most observations. However, Spitzer's observations of the infrared light allowed us to see through that dust to learn that the star is sending out powerful winds that are creating wakes in the dust, like a boat does when it travels through water. So in the bottom left, I'm showing you a Hubble image of the Ring Nebula, which revealed the gaseous layers cast off by a dying star. Uh, so these are all very powerful observatories on their own, but they're, they're also highly complementary when used together. So in the bottom right, I'm showing you the colliding antennae galaxies, which were observed by uh, Hubble, Chandra, and Spitzer. So in this image alone, we could trace the life cycle of massive stars from their formation in gas clouds that are visible at the infrared and optical wavelengths through Hubble and Spitzer. That's the red color in this picture to their afterlife as compact sources visible in the X-rays. Those are, that's the blue in this picture. So I, I just, I've just shown you a few objects that are closer to Earth, but what about those that are very far away? What are the earliest galaxies in the universe look like? So one view stands out among the rest, the Hubble Deep Field, which was produced in 1995 when Hubble was pointed at a single, nearly empty patch of sky for more than 10 days. So on screen, we have the updated Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which was taken in 2014 which totals up to 25 days of observing time with the Hubble Space Telescope in that same patch of sky. So nearly all of the objects you see in this image are galaxies. Uh, this image contains approximately 10,000 galaxies that extend, extend back in time to within a few hundred million years of the Big Bang. So the important thing to note is that when we look out in space, we're looking back in time. The light arriving at Earth from the furthest star objects in the universe is light that left those objects billions of years ago. So we see those objects not as they are today, but as they appeared long ago. And so we want to see even more of this light to see the first galaxies, but that requires we switch back to gathering infrared light in a new great observatory. Uh, the topic of this talk, NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so James Webb has three key features that make it so revolutionary. Uh, the first is the size of its mirror. This is one of the most important characteristics of a telescope. Because a mirror, a bigger mirror, means that a telescope can collect more light and see things in finer detail. The Webb mirror is 6.6 .6 meters in diameter, while Hubble's mirror is only 2.4 meters. That means that the Webb collecting area is over seven times larger than that of Hubble. And this allows us to see very faint objects. The next breakthrough of Webb is the sophistication of its instruments. So Webb carries not only uh, imaging capabilities, but also highly sophisticated spectrographs that will allow us to split light out so that the brightness at individual wavelengths can be measured. By looking at the resulting patterns in brightness, we can learn about the composition, surface temperature, density, and motions of objects in space, like planets, stars, nebulae, and galaxies. 
Web has different types of spectrographs, each designed for a slightly different purpose. So I'll, I'll go through a little bit of those later. Um, but Webb is the first telescope to have a multi-object spectrograph in space, which means we could get separate information about many objects, like individual stars, with one observation. So this is an extremely efficient observing mode. The final major strength of Webb is the type of light it will observe. So let's look at the electromagnetic spectrum. The most energetic light is on the left, the gamma rays. The least energetic light is on the right, the radio waves. The portion of the spectrum of light labeled visible with the colors of the rainbow is what humans detect as visible light. Beyond the red end of the visible spectrum, so redder than red, the wavelengths are longer than the human eye can detect. The portion of the spectrum immediately beyond red is called the infrared. So longer wavelengths, including infrared light, are able to pass through areas of dense gas clouds and other matter in the universe, whereas shorter wavelengths get trapped, which means telescopes of special and visual, vis, visible light can't capture them. So by detecting longer infrared wavelengths of light with web, we will be able to see cool stars and warm planets clearly for the first time. So I'll show later that it also allows us to detect galaxies at further distances. So Webb will match the incredible image quality offered by Hubble, but with infrared light instead of visible light. Webb, Hubble, and many other observatories will work together. They will target some of the same regions of the sky to provide simultaneous or follow-up observations in infrared light. So why do we want to study infrared light? Let's look at the advantages of infrared light using familiar objects. So visible light provides us with detailed information about our environment, including colors and textures, as seen with these meerkats on the left and the freshwater crocodile on the right. In infrared light, we see different details. The warm-blooded meerkats and the sunlit rock that they are sitting on glow dramatically, while the cold-blooded crocodile and the cool ground it is resting on glow faintly. Everything in the universe is glowing, even if we can't see it with our eyes. The wavelength of light where an object is the brightest depends on its temperature. For instance, the hot sun glows brightest in the visible. Meanwhile, much cooler objects, such as humans, animals, and computers, glow brightest in the infrared. The temperature of the object also determines its overall brightness, not just where it's brightest. So warmer objects glow brighter than cooler obje objects. So by taking a measure of the brightness in the infrared, we can direct, indirectly measure the temperature of the cooler objects that peak in the infrared. Another key advantage of light along wavelengths like the infrared is that uh, they can more easily travel through dense material. So on the left here, I'm showing a visible light image, and on the right, I'm showing a, the, the uh, corresponding infrared light image. So that means, this means that it can reveal objects that are otherwise blocked in the visible. Here we can see that this person's hand becomes visible through the plastic bag in the infrared. So let's take that concept to space. By specializing in infrared light, Webb will be able to see what's behind dense dust that we see everywhere in the universe. As an example, let's take a look at the so-called pillars of creation. This is a region of dense gas and dust where stars are actively forming. It was imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope in visible light at left, near infrared light in the middle, and the Spitzer Space Telescope in the mid infrared light at right. So from left to right, these images show redder and redder light. So the stars that are forming are inside the dense cocoons of gas you see in the left image. So what does each type of light show? In visible light, the light from these stars is blocked. This is just like the hand being blocked by the plastic bag in the last slide and never actually reaches uh, Earth and never reaches our telescope. The near infrared, that middle panel, uh, the, light from these star, uh, uh, the, the light from these stars shines through all but the densest dust, revealing many stars inside and uh, around the pillar. So if you compare the left panel with the middle panel, you see that just these stars that are hidden in visible light just pop out in the infrared. The mid-infrared light shows that the eroded pillars of gas and dust glow with heat from bright young stars, just like the meerkats from earlier. Like Spitzer, Webb will be able to see through the dust in regions like this, but at high resolution, like Hubble. One of the other major advantages of Webb's sensitivity to infrared light is that it will allow us to see the ancient light of the first galaxies. So as light travels through the expanding universe, it is stretched into longer wavelengths, which is called cosmological redshift. 
For the extremely distant galaxies, light that was originally emitted as ultraviolet and visible light is stretched to the longer wavelengths of infrared light by the time it reaches Earth. This is the light Webb will capture and how it can observe the earliest galaxies. When Webb takes its first deep fields, we will some, see some of the first galaxies that formed in the universe. Now that we know why infrared light is so valuable, let's explore all the amazing science that Webb will contribute. So Webb will contribute to all areas of astronomy, the early universe, the formation and evolution of galaxies and stars, black holes and distant worlds around other stars. And it's most exciting discoveries, maybe the ones that we didn't anticipate. That was a lesson that we learned with Hubble. So let's start with the early universe. Webb can peer, peer deep into space, capturing some of the first galaxies that formed as the universe cooled down after the Big Bang over 13 and a half billion years ago. So during this period, which is known as the era of reionization, the universe was a very different place. The gas between galaxies was largely opaque to energetic light. This is shown in the left image, which makes it difficult to observe young galaxies. So one major question is what allowed the universe to become completely ionized or transparent? eventually leading to the clear conditions detected in much of the universe today, as seen in the right image. When did it begin and how long did this process take? So Webb's infrared observations will help us create the first detailed snapshot of galaxies in the early universe and provide much more information than, than uh, ever possible before. So these new data will allow us to analyze individual objects to understand how the surrounding gas changed from neutral to ionized, creating the transparent universe we see today. Uh, one of the major achievements of Webb is that uh, it will discover some of the first galaxies. So as an example, this galaxy that I'm showing you here is named GNZ11 and is the oldest galaxy we have identified to date. So we see it imaged here with Hubble as it was 13.4 billion years in the past. That's just 400 million years after the Big Bang. This is an incredible achievement of the Hubble Space Telescope. So while Hubble can see only a few of the brightest of these early galaxies, Webb is capable of revealing much more of the general galaxy population during this time. And we'll be able to reveal the physical properties of these galaxies in much greater detail. That is, how fast are they forming stars? How massive are they? And what is their chemical composition? So these are key measurements that we need to make to understand how these first galaxies formed. So as I said, by measuring the redshift of the light of a galaxy, we can pinpoint how long that galaxy has been traveling to us through expanding space. And thus, the age of the universe that we are looking back to when we see that galaxy. So this leads to Webb's next science specialty, studying galaxies over time. By viewing galaxies in the universe at different distances and thus different eras, Hubble and other telescopes have shown us that galaxies change over time. They grow, collide, and merge with each other, as we saw in the, the, the simulation movie. So in this flipbook, we are seeing galaxies as they looked at various times in the history of the universe, from uh, very early times at the right to close to the present day at the left. The most distant earliest galaxies we have seen tend to be smaller and less structured than those in the present day. However, the earliest galaxies in the universe are still undetected. Webb will examine these early galaxies and eras that followed in new detail, providing essential insight and helping us learn about how galaxies evolve. What's great about this is that Webb's observations will be added to Hubble's, so we'll learn even more about dust, stars, and galaxies over cosmic time. Webb will also help us learn about the history of the mergers and growth of galaxies, black holes, and the history of star formation. Uh, Webb will also study black holes, both near and far. So in our galaxy, Webb will peer through obscuring dust to study the supermassive black hole that resides at our center and the stars that orbit it. In other galaxies, Webb will take spectra to learn about the temperatures, speeds, and compositions of the material at the centers. This information can then be used uh, to measure the mass of the black holes at the centers of these galaxies. Webb will also study the feedback loop between central black holes, the powerful jets that they emit, as illustrated in this figure, and the formation of new stars in those galaxies. This will help address broader questions on how galaxies form, including the longstanding problem of which came first, the galaxy or the black hole. So next up for Webb is our stars. 
So these are two views of the same object. It's an area of star formation in our galaxy nicknamed Mystic Mountain. The visible light image on the left shows how scorching radiation and fast winds from super hot new stars are shaping and compressing the pillar, causing new stars to form. But these forming stars remain unseen behind the dusty towering peaks. In the near infrared image on the right, the foreground pillar becomes semi-transparent because infrared light from background stars is able to penetrate through much of that dust. Again, like the hand through the plastic bag from before. So Webb's view will show us even more of the details of these star forming regions. Its images and data will help us learn about the physical and chemical properties of stellar and planetary systems. It will also give us new insight into their formation history. So Webb can also detect molecules in space, including in the nearby galaxy here. So the real power of Webb is in its spectroscopic capabilities, as we discussed earlier, where Webb will separate light into its component wavelengths. So astronomers will use spectra captured by Webb to study stars of different sizes, masses, ages, colors, temperatures, evolutionary stages, and environments. They will study newly forming stars that are cocooned in dense dark clouds of gas and dust, cold molecular clouds that collapse to form stars, gas and dust ejected from dying stars, and the molecules between stars. And this is all due to the power of the spectroscopy. Uh, Webb will also explore planets in our own solar system and worlds that are light years away. So it can gather data about Mars, Jupiter, which is shown uh, here in near infrared light, uh, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune to help us build a broader picture of the objects in our solar system. So specifically, Webb will help us better understand Mars's atmosphere. It'll map the cloud structures on Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and then study the seasonal weather and climate variations on these gas giant planets and their moons, and study the composition of asteroids and objects in our solar system beyond Neptune. Uh, but we know from other missions that there are, are many more planets out there. So Webb will also study these other planets in our galaxy, extending the scientific uh, discoveries of the other NASA missions. So if you're interested in planets inside and outside our solar system, follow Webb closely because we're gonna uh, learn a lot. So many observations are already study distant planets, but what will Webb do differently? So planets generally grow brightly in infrared light. While their host star, just like the sun is the host star of the solar system, their host star usually doesn't shine as brightly in those wavelengths. So this contrast means that infrared light is the ideal wavelength range to observe planets around other stars. So from its position in space and with its huge mirrors, Webb will be able to capture longer infrared wavelengths of light in high resolution for the first time. Webb's unique abilities to take very sharp and very fast images also allow it to spot smaller planets than other telescopes. So the image shown above are direct observations of a distant solar system known as HR8799. Most of the light of the star at the center is blocked by an instrument known as a coronagraph, making it possible to detect four planets. And so those, I marked those four planets with arrows. They're the white points. It is clear that this is a solar system viewed from above. So Webb will be able to spot planets that are over 10 million times fainter than their host stars. And by measuring the brightness of these planets in the infrared, we could learn about their masses and sizes. Uh, so Webb will not only image distant planets, but also reveal their chemical composition. So measuring a planet's atmosphere from hundreds or thousands of light years away is not as daunting as it may sound, though it certainly requires specialized instrument, instruments and rigorous techniques. So one method Webb will use is known as transmission spectroscopy. Uh, the idea is this. So Webb will first avert, observe the spectrum of the host star when the planet is either behind or to the side of the star from our point of view. When the planet passes in front of the star, well, Webb will observe the spectrum once again. In this case, molecules in the atmosphere of the planet will absorb a small fraction of that starlight, and this light never makes it to Webb. And so, by subtracting the star's light spectrum from the star plus planet spectrum, we can see which wavelengths of light are missing and then identify the molecules that are known to absorb at those wavelengths. So this is a cartoon of a transmission spectrum, which shows the wavelengths that molecules like oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, and methane absorb light. By using both imaging and spectroscopy, 
Webb will return incredible detail about planets we haven't been able to, to detect with other telescopes. So spectroscopy helps researchers identify the colors, temperatures, motions, and masses of celestial objects, helping us learn more about these distant worlds. Uh, so now that we have a sense for the science web will undertake, let's explore its design. So specifically, the questions are, where will web orbit? Why does it have a hot and a cold side? And why is it an ambitious piece of engineering? So NASA had a lot of information to build on when designing Webb, since other telescopes were designed and launched before it. Uh, planning for Webb began in 1989. So for context, Hubble was launched in 1990. So the next generation space telescope, as it was originally known, was renamed the James Webb Space Telescope in 2002. Construction began on its instruments in that same year. Since new technologies were required, along with a battery of tests at every stage of development, scientists and engineers took time to ensure each instrument operated as planned. So several innovative and powerful new technologies make Webb's ambitious science goals possible. This includes specialized optics to align the mirrors, detectors that can capture and separate light from hundreds of sources at, one, at once, and thermal control systems. These technologies make Webb the most sophisticated and complex space science telescope ever created. So Webb is a collection of movable parts that have been designed to fold into a compact formation that is considerably smaller than when the observatory is fully deployed. So this allows it to just barely fit in the five meter storage space of the rocket that will be used to transport it to space. So this is shown on the right. It's going to sit in the nose cone of this, of this rocket. It's an RN5 rocket provided by uh, ESA, the European Space Agency. Um, and so Webb like, has a, uh, an origami-like structure where it could fold up on itself so it could fit in that small space. And since Webb's mirrors need to fold to fit, engineers ensured its 18 mirror segments can also be adjusted to form a single perfect fo focus. Each mirror segment has an actuator or tiny mechanical motor attached to the back, allowing operators to move each. Webb also has a tennis court sized sun shield that is deployed by over 140 motors and thousands of other components, which unfold and stretch the five membranes of the sun shield into its final taut shape. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But let, first, let's look closer at its mirrors. So here's that comparison with Hubble's mirror that I showed previously. So Webb has a primary mirror with a diameter of 6.6 .6 meters. It's quite large, and that's for several reasons. Webb has to have a big mirror to capture high-resolution Hubble-like details and in infrared light. Its mirror also needs to be stable at very cold temperatures, about 40 Kelvin, which is roughly negative 390 degrees Fahrenheit, which is why it's made of beryllium, which is six times stronger than steel and two-thirds the density of aluminum. Uh, there are 18 hexagonal segments. They're hexagons, so the mirrors can be adjusted to align without gaps and form a circular shape. Uh, each segment is coated in a very thin layer of gold. It's about a thousand atoms thick. So gold was selected because it's the best reflector of infrared light. So how will Webb conduct its science ob observations? Let's start with a little bit of context for this image. The Whirlpool galaxy seen here in the background is about a third of the size of the moon uh, as we see it from Earth. And on top of that are overlaid the four uh, science instruments that Webb will carry. So there's the near cam, which has a dual field of view. Those are the two squares on the left. There's the near spec, which has a fairly large field of view, and then MIRI and MIRIS. Although some uh, instruments are more suitable than others for observing specific types of targets, all four can be used for investigations of the wide variety of objects that make up the universe, as I discussed uh, previously. And each of uh, Webb's four instruments is like a Swiss Army knife of more specialized components with multiple ways of observing. So Webb's four science instruments, Mirspec, Nearest, Nearcam, and Miri, uh, are sensitive to a range of infrared light. So the first is Nearspec, which will be the first multi-object spectrograph in space. Nearspec can capture individual spectra, 
of dozens of objects at once, which make an ideal for efficiently studying many distant faint galaxies. The nearest and near-cam instruments will also allow us to gather high-resolution imaging and spectroscopy, and together these instruments will carry out most of the science goals I, dis I discussed earlier, including measuring the physical properties of distant galaxies, black holes, the stars in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies, and planets in and out of our solar system. The mid-infrared instrument, or MIRI, is another powerhouse. It can take images and gather spectra, and it covers longer and redder infrared wavelengths of light. As the only mid-infrared instrument, we will rely on MIRI to study cooler objects like debris disks around stars, which emit most of their light in the mid-infrared, and extremely distant galaxies whose light has been shifted into the mid-infrared over time. So where will Webb orbit? So Webb will orbit the sun near what is known as the second Sun-Earth Lagrange point. This is often referred to as L2. It's a point where the gravity from the sun and Earth balance the force from the spacecraft's orbit, and as shown in this figure here. The point is approximately one and a half million kilometers, or 930,000 miles, from Earth on the far side of Earth from the sun. Webb well, will not be located precisely at L2, but will move in a halo orbit around L2 as it orbits the sun, as, as uh, shown in this diagram here. Um, so Webb can't orbit the Earth like Hubble because the visible and infrared light from the sun, Earth, and moon would heat up the telescope's mirror and scientific instruments, causing the telescope itself to glow in infrared light that would outshine the faint objects in space. At L2, Webb can maintain a safe distance from the bright lights of the sun, Earth, and moon, while also maintaining its position relative to Earth. Um, so here's that sun shield. So the lower part of Webb is where the five layered sun shield rests. And that sun shield always faces the sun. And this is where its ambient temperature equipment um, rests as well, like its solar panel, its antenna, computer, gyroscopes, and navigational jets are. Uh, its tennis court size sun shield protects Webb from external sources of light and heat, which ensures it can detect faint infrared signals from very distant objects. It's very important for its observing side to be very, very cold. So that's the that's shown on the left. That's the, the mirror and the instruments. So without cooling, the only thing that Webb would see would be itself, since warm things glow in infrared light, as we discussed earlier. Webb has to be cold or else its self-emission would produce enough background light that it would overwhelm the faint sources it's trying to observe. Uh, so Webb's science instruments are housed behind the mirror, separated from the warm communication and control technology that are um, located by the sun shield. So for reference, over this small area between the, the observing side and the sun facing side, the mirror side will be kept around not negative 390 degrees Fahrenheit, while the sun facing side will be at around 260 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a huge temperature difference over that, that very small area. Um, and so Webb needs uh, both passive and active cooling. Its, its sun shield provides passive cooling. The first layer of the sun shield is two thousandths of an inch thick, while the other four layers are only one thousandth of an inch, of an inch thick. And their main goal is to keep Webb cool. So late last month, Webb was care carefully folded up and loaded onto a ship which passed through the Panama Canal on its way to its launch site in the French Guiana in South America. It is beneficial for launch sites to be located near the equator because the spin of the Earth can help give an additional uh, push to the rocket. So after launch and during the first month in space on its way to that second Lagrange point L2, Webb will undergo a complex unfolding sequence. And so that's shown in this figure here. Uh, this will include deploying, tensioning, and separating that uh, sun shield we just discussed. Uh, then it will extend its secondary mirror uh, support structure and unfold its primary mirror. The deployment and commissioning will take at least six months. Engineers and scientists will carefully activate and confirm each and every instrument is working properly before the first image of a star field is delivered about two months after it launches. In the third month after launch, Webb will complete its first orbit around L2 and take the first focused science quality images. After the six month mark, Webb will begin its science mission and start to conduct routine science operations. As I stated earlier, the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland plays a key role in communicating with Webb. Uh, it hosts Webb's Mission Operations Center where engineers and scientists command and control the telescope. 
So commands from STSCI travel to the Deep Space Net Network, the DSN, which transmits them back to web. Uh, web's data then return through the Deep Space Network to STSCI, where the uh, data web took are then processed, distributed to the scientific community and archived. As a lead agency, NASA has overall responsibility for the web mission. However, web has been international collaboration since the beginning. More than 120 American, European, and Canadian observatories, organizations, and companies in 14 different countries and over 29 US states contribute to web. So in short, the launch of web marks a remarkable moment for astronomy. About six months after it launches, Webb will begin its science mission and start to conduct routine science operations. And as I said earlier, it promises to truly revolutionize our understanding of the universe and our place within it. So keep your ears tuned for all the exciting discoveries to come. And so I want to sincerely thank you for your time and attention. And again, I want to thank the organizers of Hopkins at Home and the STSCI uh, Office of Public Outreach. And I'm, I'm very happy to field questions. Um, so we could start, how badly do black holes obstruct views? So black holes are actually, in terms of a, the, surf, the projected surface area on the sky, are relatively, uh, relatively tiny. They're, they're incredibly tiny, actually. Um, so they don't actually obstruct uh, the, the views of the centers of the galaxies. And the way we observe black holes with a telescope like Webb is we see how it interacts with its surrounding medium. So we can measure the, the essentially the motions of the, the material that's surrounding the black hole, measure how fast those, the, uh, that material is moving, and work out how much, uh, what the, the gravitational field looks like there. And that's how we, we really make a measurement of the black holes. Um, but th the black holes themselves are actually make up a very small, a very tiny surface area in the sky, negligible. So are the colors in these images true to what the telescopes collect or is the color corrected afterwards? And if using different wavelengths, would we see the same colors when looking ourselves? So this is an excellent question. Um, so we have to think about what the eye does for us. So when we look out, that, so I guess the, 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 the point is that, that there's no true color in the universe. The eye is interpreting the spectrum of light um, that that uh, that reaches us and is in, and our brain is interpreting it as a specific color. So what what telescopes like Hubble and Webb do is they have cameras that are sensitive to a specific range of light, and afterwards we add those together to create a Hubble uh, a, a color image, and that color image um, is not necessarily tuned to the same way that our brain is processing. That, that, that set of colors, if that makes sense. And so when we think about like the color images that Webb will create, these are, these are wavelengths that our eye can't interpret. And so, um, and so the color images we see, if we were to try to, we would not, we would not be able to interpret the infrared light um, with, with our naked eye. But that's, a, that's an excellent question. So once it's fully set up, what will command of the web look like on a day-to-day -day basis? So at, this, at Space Telescope Science Institute, um, at the Missions Operations Center, they're constantly monitoring the health and safety of the spacecraft. Um, and they're, they're, they're essentially constantly giving it commands um, based on the, the science program that is to be executed on where it needs to, uh, where it needs to point to in space. Um, and so day to day, there's a lot of uh, active guidance. Once every two weeks, there's the there's a thrust with the the, the fuel reservoir that that Webb carries um, to to maintain it on its halo orbit at uh, L2. So the day to day operation is actually uh, quite quite active. Um, what is a coronagraph and how does it work? So a coronagraph, you could think of it as um, essentially a uh, a sophisticated like piece of metal that's just um, that's just uh, put up in front of a bright light. So if you're if you're standing outside uh, on a street corner and you see your friend out in the distance, so this is nighttime, um, and there are bright street lamps, and you want to really like be able to, to to make out your friend, the contrast between the street lamp and your friend who might be um, in dark shadow uh, is quite high. And so you might stick your hand up to cover that. 
uh, bright light so that your eyes can adjust to a new contrast sensitivity and just make out your friend. And so that's essentially what a coronagraph is doing. It's it's putting up a, a sophisticated uh, machine uh, object to block out uh, block out the light in the center of the image. Um, so does light from distant galaxies really stretch out over long distances, or does it just look that way because of the Doppler effect? I remember something um, about the universe expanding and how that affects the light wave uh, we perceive. Yes. So. So the the light um, the light does stretch out the the wavelength of the light stretches out as it's moving um, through expanding space. But you can think of this as essentially a Doppler sh uh, a, a Doppler shift. It is a Doppler shift. And so uh, the analogy with sound is if you had an ambulance coming towards you, the sound waves. So if the ambulance emits a sound wave, the next crest of that wave as the ambulance is traveling towards you. Is that a sh is that a shorter? There's a shorter wavelength there than the native, uh, the native wavelength of the sound wave. And so when those sound waves finally hit you, uh, they sound to be the the sound is at a higher pitch than they they natively are from the ambulance. And the same thing as the as the ambulance is moving away from you. And so that's the Doppler effect. Um, and it's a very uh, similar similar uh, uh, analogy with with uh, with space. Essentially, the galaxies are. Are uh, traveling uh, further and further, faster and faster as they're uh, at further and further distances. So, what are the first things Webb is scheduled to observe? That's an excellent question. So, there's a range of programs um, that are scheduled that uh, are essentially going to touch on the entire science program uh, that I laid out here. Um, there are programs to image uh, the disks around. Uh, solar system, so the debris disks, the cold, um, dusty disks in early solar systems, uh, to try to understand how planets eventually will form out of those disks. There's programs aimed at detecting the first galaxies. Um, there's uh, programs uh, aimed at looking at star clusters. There's programs aimed at looking at galaxy clusters. So it really is um, a, a broad program is scheduled to really touch on all of the, the major science goals of, of the uh, observatory. Uh, so since construction of web started nearly two decades ago, but the technologies have been evolving very fast, how do engineers and other specialists who built web keep up with technological evolution so that when it is launched, it is the, at the latest state of the art? So that's an excellent question. Um, I'm not on the engineering side of things, so I, I don't know if I if I have a firm uh, answer for you. But I think in the early days, there is a lot of adaptation to the latest technologies, and it's important to to, to know that uh, that the construction of web is actually the thing that's pushing a lot of these technologies forward. the The construction of web is the 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 state of the art. So the the multi object spectrograph that I that I mentioned that's that's essentially a new technology that was uh, developed developed for web. But I know that in the early days, um, definitely as uh, like computer systems are um, uh, are updated, like those those technologies are incorporated into the, the design. Um, but that's an excellent question. I, I hope I answered it well enough. Um, so if web is orbiting the sun, what will be, what will be the delay in communication? Um, so the the great thing about the, the L2 location is that it's always at the same distance from the Earth. So you have the Sun, the Earth, and L2. And essentially, L2 and the Sun are, are the, the spacecraft and Earth are always going to be in the same relative position to one, each, one another. So that's one of the advantages of putting it at L2, because if it was on its own orbit, um, you would have delays in communication that, that would be introduced based on you know the season of where the the earth uh, and, and sun were located. Uh, so when you were talking about fuel, does web have a fuel tank or does it take fuel from the environment? Um, so web does have a reserve fuel um, that will last a, uh, about 10 years, I believe. Um, it also has solar panels that um, assist in the, the operation of the instruments. 
um, what will be uh, your role with web before and after launch? Um, so I'm a part of um, several of the, the science programs that are um, that are due to uh, be executed. So I'm a, I'm a scientist by trade. Um, and so my role with the observatory will really be analyzing um, those first data that, that, that are, are coming from the observatory. And based on what we learned from those data, uh, proposing for new observations and and really trying to like push push our, our science questions forward. But I'm on this I'm on the science uh, side of things. Um, how vulnerable is JWST to space debris and dust? How is it protected? Um, uh, that that's a that's an excellent question. Um, and I don't. And I'm sorry, I don't actually have a good answer for you. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. I, I don't have an answer for that, I'm sorry. Um, did I miss anything? Let's see. Are there any disadvantages to the infrared? Um, well, the so the way that the way that the the resolution of a mirror works is that bigger mirrors can resolve things um more finely but also um at shorter wavelengths so in the visible and in the ultraviolet which is bluer than the blue light we could see you could also re resolve things um easier so when you start pushing to the to the the redder end of the spectrum it actually becomes harder for the same mirror size to resolve things. Um, and so that's why Webb needs to be, you know, three times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope to get the same resolution in the infrared. Um, and so that's the main disadvantage is that the resolution requirements um, become kind of tough out in the, in the infrared. That's a, that's a really excellent question as well. These are all very excellent questions. Um, did, I, did I miss? So how do scientists prepare their work around what web is going to be looking at? And are there certain things they're expecting? So the way that it works is um, essentially you have a prediction for, um, let's say you have a, a prediction for how you think uh, 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 like galaxies evolve with time, right? And you have actual predictions for the, the light that they should emit and the, the masses and the star formation rates. So what scientists do is they take those predictions and they say, if these predictions were observable by Webb, um, what would they look like? Would Webb be able to distinguish between my model and my colleague's model? Um, and so a lot of the, the prep work that's going into Webb is understanding really what the limits are <clears throat> um, on, on what uh, essentially what are the constraints that web um will allow us to place on our various models of how the universe works so i i gave you the example of, of uh of like galaxies but the same is true for stars and black holes so a lot of the prep work for web yeah is understanding those constraints um and then are there certain things they're expecting um so yeah so so most everyone can can like quote to you um based on their specific science field like a web will observe down to galaxies with this mass at this redshift um and that's based on a lot of this uh this modeling that goes in ahead of time so is web expected to refuel in space after 10 years as gso satellites are starting to do now as far as i know no, there is actually there's no plan to service web at L2. Um, the nominal lifetime of the mission is five years. Um, it has a fuel reservoir for for 10 years of of uh, of those uh, orbital corrections I was uh, mentioning earlier. Um, and as of now, there's no there's there, there are no plans to, to service web. Um, unlike Hubble, which, you know, is um, orbiting right around Earth, we 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 have sent um, 
we have sent uh, shuttles up in the past to, to service Hubble, but with web, uh, it will be uh, at an unserviceable location for now, uh, of course. Um, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, remote uh, technologies will be created over the next decades. I might make it uh, serviceable, but there are, there are no plans uh, for now. Um, so the limits for the for the observatory um, are primarily the um, are primarily the fuel reservoir. Um, the instruments themselves are designed to age gracefully, as they put it. Um, and there are redundancies in place for the instruments. And so the instruments on Hubble, for instance, have been working like a charm for 30 years. And so the instruments should outlive uh, the, the fuel reservoir, but the fuel reservoir is the, is the main limiting factor at this point. I'm happy to continue to field questions. So Will, I see you uh, placing questions. So what is a chronograph and how does it work? Yeah, so that's the, that's the um, essentially it obstructs the light of uh, of bright objects. So for for uh, imaging planets, uh, that's the the bright star that that's, will generally overwhelm the planets by a factor of ten thousand to ten million. Um, um, so it sounds like that's it. Um, I want to thank you all again um, for listening, for asking such excellent questions. Um, I want to thank the organizers of Hopkins at Home, and I want to, um, if you're interested in web, I know there's a lot more content coming out from Hopkins at Home, so please, uh, uh, you know, keep in touch with, uh, with uh, their website. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. I appreciate it.